Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for taking time out of your day to listen to this webinar. I'm really excited to be here and talk with you all. And thank you to Spark for inviting me to speak about this very important topic and for that lovely introduction. Today, I'm going to be talking about how we as clinicians and researchers can support parents of young children with autism in the early intervention process. But before I do that, I just want to make an important note um, to share that when I'm using the term parent throughout this webinar, I will be referring to any primary caregiver for a child with autism. This absolutely could include grandparents or other relatives and primary caregivers. But for ease of speech today, I'm going to be using the word parent to refer to this group of caregivers for children with autism. So why should we focus on parent involvement in early intervention? There are many reasons why supporting parents throughout the early intervention process is critical. We all know that and you know, to think of a few, first and foremost, we know that parents are their child's primary and most important teachers. This is true throughout childhood, but we know that this is especially true in early childhood. And we can look at the model of transactional child development to help illustrate this point. This model emphasizes the primary role that parents play in their child's development. In this model, when we think about a child's learning and development, we're largely thinking about how that learning is related to their primary, to their interactions with their primary caregivers. We know that the primary interactions with their caregivers largely shapes development throughout early childhood. And so helping caregivers learn how to interact with their child in a way that fosters development is critical. For children with atypical development, this may be especially critical. Second, supporting parents and providing family-centered practices are a hallmark of best practices in early intervention. The use of family-centered practices are a primary recommendation for early intervention by the Division of Early Childhood. And there are many federal and state level guidelines which highlight the importance of improving services that foster parent involvement throughout their child's early intervention. Third, we know that the research on increased levels of parent stress associated with the diagnosis of autism is clear. We know that parents of children with autism experience higher rates of stress. We also know that supporting parents in their child's early intervention can lead to improved feelings of parent empowerment and improvements in self-efficacy. So it makes sense that including parents in their child's treatment would lead to improved family outcomes. There's a large body of research that shows that involving parents in their child's early intervention has been repeatedly associated with improved long-term outcomes for both the child and for the overall family functioning. It's important that parents are involved. The research is showing us this, but what does parent involvement usually look like in practice? How are parents usually involved? When we think about involving parents in early intervention, we know that parent involvement can take many different forms. Involvement can occur at many different points of the intervention process, from choosing the intervention approach and the service provider, to identifying treatment goals, to delivering the intervention itself. At each of these points, we can see very different levels of parent involvement. Sometimes parents may actively choose a treatment approach for their child. At other times, a parent may accept recommendations from a doctor or from another professional about which type of treatment is best for their child. The same is true for goal selection and for treatment delivery. In some cases, parents may have an active role in identifying which goals they want their child to work on and in working on those goals. There are many factors that likely influence how parents are involved in their child's early intervention. Parent preferences and expectations are likely to play a role in their level of involvement in their child's treatment. But I think there are also other factors that might influence how a parent is involved. And I think that those factors that are related to the structure and the delivery of the child's treatment are especially critical for us to think through. My goal for today is for us to discuss how the type of intervention and the strategies used during early autism intervention can directly impact the level of parent involvement in treatment. But before we can have that discussion, I think it's important for us to discuss the different types of approaches that are most often used in early intervention and how those approaches may or may not facilitate parent involvement. And so we're gonna take a bit of a sideways step here for a minute and talk about intervention approaches. So when we think about intervention for young children with ASD, historically we look at these intervention approaches as falling into two distinct buckets. 
The past few decades of research in early intervention has identified two main bodies of intervention, and those would be the developmental approaches and the behavioral approaches. Parent involvement across and within each of these approaches to intervention can differ greatly. And so I want us to take a closer look at each of these approaches and think about how we might include parents in the delivery of early intervention that might fall into each of these categories. So we'll start with taking a look at the developmental approaches to early intervention. When we think about developmental approaches to early intervention, we are thinking about the pioneering work of Stanley Greenspan and his colleagues. We're thinking about things like floor time and RDI. These approaches are based on developmental psychology and include a deep understanding of child development. Some of the key aspects of, de of developmental approaches are that the children are taught within developmental sequences and that the learning of new experiences is explicitly connected with their existing knowledge. This is thought to lead to a more flexible and fluid skill set that will generalize across settings. Another key aspect of developmental approaches to early intervention is that these approaches are largely based on using strategies that foster the child's initiation and their spontaneous use of techniques. It's largely based on following the child's lead and using things that are interesting to the child within a play-based format to guide instruction. When we're looking at developmental approaches to intervention, we see that these approaches usually are implemented within everyday routines and within natural contexts. Including parents within the treatment for developmental approaches is often a hallmark of these approaches um, and is critical to the delivery of the approach within the context of daily routines and natural contexts. Another popular approach to treatment for um, young children with autism are the behavioral approaches. And when we are thinking about behavioral approaches to intervention, we are thinking about applied behavior analysis and the pioneering work of Lovas, who first applied this science to the treatment of individuals with autism. The behavioral approaches to early intervention are based on behavioral learning theory and environmental arrangement to shape behavior. Some of the key aspects of behavioral approaches to intervention, when we're using these, we're thinking about learning as a product of antecedents and consequences. We are explicitly using reinforcement and we are explicitly structuring the environment to promote learning. As we're using these approaches, we're taking complex skills and we're breaking them down into small parts and teaching them in isolation. These approaches can lie on a continuum of those that are highly structured and didactic, like discrete trial training, to those that are more naturalistic and play-based, like naturalistic behavioral interventions. All of these include a systematic shaping of behavior and environmental arrangement to promote optimal learning. A key aspect of these approaches that lies in contrast to developmental approaches is that they are often therapist or instructor led as opposed to child led. And while although they can be play based within a behavioral approach to intervention, often these skills are taught um, using a curriculum and a set of sequence of goals that is uh, guided by a therapist. When we're thinking about parent involvement in behavioral approaches to early intervention, this often includes parent training and identifying goals for the child um, while the intervention, intervention is being delivered by the therapist as opposed to the parent um, and potentially giving the parent some ideas to work on outside of session, um, but the intervention is primarily delivered by the therapist. And so when we think back about the debate between develop, developmental approaches and behavioral approaches, historically within the autism treatment, there's been a lot of conflict and debate among practitioners regarding the appropriateness of the and effectiveness of these approaches. So if you are a developmentally based practitioner, you most likely did not condone the use of behavioral strategies in treatment. And if you're a behaviorist, you likely are strictly adhering to behavioral principles to guide your approach to intervention. This has caused a lot of tension among autism interventionists and confusion for parents who often receive conflicting recommendations and opinions from professionals. This can be a very, difficult, a very difficult circumstance for parents to navigate as they are hearing from different professionals that there are different approaches to use. Um, and each professional has been very passionate and tied to their approach to intervention. But fortunately, as our science has evolved, leaders in early autism intervention research are reshaping the way early autism treatment is described and breaking down the walls between these two approaches. This has um, recently gain a lot of attention um, with some excellent work that was led by Laura Shryman and other pioneers in autism 
intervention research when they coined the term naturalistic developmental behavioral interventions. And so you'll hear them referred to as NDBIs. Um, these approaches are used to describe a new breed of early intervention approaches that draw from both developmental and behavioral learning theories to guide early autism treatment. When we think about naturalistic behavioral developmental interventions, we think of these as lying at the intersection between behavioral approaches to early intervention and developmental approaches to early intervention. Rather than viewing these approaches as distinct and incompatible, leading intervention developers have identified core elements from each paradigm that are essential for effective early autism treatment. So some of those approaches that we want to consider um, that make them developmental are the consideration of a child's developmental level. The intervention approach is largely based on developmental sequencing and making sure that the goals of the intervention are appropriate for the child's developmental level of functioning. These approaches are child-led um, and they are largely based on using the child's motivation and interest to guide instruction. They are also used within the natural environment. And so we see that these approaches are being implemented within play-based routines or within daily context as opposed to more structured uh, and distinct setting. But they pull from behavioral approaches as well and that they use behavioral learning theory to guide the way the instruction is implemented. And these include things like systematic prompting, systematic reinforcement, and environmental arrangement. It's important to note that the systematic reinforcement is used within the context of natural reinforcement, as opposed to using a distinct set of reinforcers. Um, and environmental arrangement is used to promote communication and interaction. As we are going through and thinking about how these approaches are used in combination, it really is a fluid back and forth where the interventionist is using developmental approaches and behavioral approaches throughout the instruction to guide how that intervention is implemented. There are some basic ingredients that are um, at the core of naturalistic developmental behavioral interventions. And some of these are common, um, commonly used across a bunch of different types of approaches. The first is environmental arrangement. And critical to the use of this kind of approach is arranging the environment to promote social engagement and social interaction, also to promote communication. Um, it is very important that the environment is arranged in a way to promote that interaction. But more importantly is that we are using the child's interests and we are using child initiated teaching episodes to guide each interaction with the child and following the child's lead to promote motivation and interaction. We're also making sure that we're using a lot of natural reinforcement throughout these approaches. And we're doing modeling and effective prompting within the context of balanced turn taking to guide how the intervention is delivered. This is a shift in what has traditionally been used within early intervention. Um, and it's important to note that these kinds of approaches are all used, um, these ingredients are used together um, within the context of a fluid back and forth interaction between a child and an adult. And so why am I bringing up the use of naturalistic developmental behavioral interventions within this discussion that I'm having today about parent involvement and supporting parents in early intervention? I think there are a lot of reasons why it's important to think about this approach of using NDBI strategies um, as an appropriate tool for early intervention. One thing that I think is important to know is that these approaches have a contextual fit for early intervention. They strongly align with the mission and the values of what we believe as being effective approaches for early intervention for children with a range of disabilities. It's also important to note that these approaches have some established evidence at this point. And so we see language and communication gates when these approaches are used. We see improved long-term outcomes. And we know that they are developmentally appropriate and that the, the skills that are being taught to children using these approaches are designed in a way and implemented in a way that is appropriate for their developmental level of functioning. I think the most important thing to note why, and why I bring this up today is that these approaches lend themselves really well to family involvement. Family involvement in early intervention is something that is critical, but family involvement is something that can be easily fostered when we're using a naturalistic developmental behavioral intervention. Because these interventions are provided 
within the context of everyday routines and within the context of naturally occurring situations in the family's life, we can easily embed these kinds of approaches that have a strong evidence base because they pull from behavioral strategies that we know are effective in changing behavior and shaping skill acquisition for young children. And we can marry these approaches and include parents in their implementation to better support overall family functioning. So what does family involvement look like in early intervention? Traditionally, when we think about early intervention for young children with autism, we think about either therapist-mediated interventions or parent-mediated interventions. As intervention has evolved, we're seeing that these interventions are taking more of a focus on using parent-mediated interventions for young children with autism, as opposed to only relying on therapist implementation of these interventions. When we think about parent-mediated interventions for young children with autism, there are many that have evolved um, and that are being packaged and that have a strong evidence base for support. So we think about Project Impact. We think about ESDM. We think about PACT, JASPER, and ESI, to name a few. Each of these approaches have a packaged curriculum They've been manualized and they have a strong evidence base. Each of these has a randomized trial to show that they are effective in improving a range of both child and family outcomes when they are implemented. I think what's important to note is that each of these interventions has two core components. The first is that they have child-focused intervention targets and strategies that largely pull from the naturalistic developmental behavioral intervention framework to guide the skills and the strategies and the goals that are being used with children. But second, they all include some form of parent coaching. And they're using parent coaching to guide how the intervention is delivered. They're explicitly including parents in the delivery of these interventions in a targeted and purposeful way to make sure that parents are centrally involved in the delivery of these interventions for young children with autism. So why is that important? I think it's important to note that parent coaching is the common component to all of those efficacious parent-mediated interventions that I just described. They all have very different components and different pieces. The thing that guides them and, draw and binds all of them is that they all involve some level of parent coaching. The reason that's important is because parent coaching has been shown to lead to increased parent engagement and parent self-efficacy. And so if you're spending time working with a parent on specific skills, we're more likely to see that that parent is likely to be engaged and they're likely to feel self-empowered about their ability to affect their child's long-term outcomes. When we see increases in parent engagement and self-efficacy, we're seeing increases in parent treatment fidelity. And what that means is that parents are now able to learn how to implement certain strategies that have been used to help their child gain skills. And they're now able to use those skills throughout their lives and more functional daily routines. And when that happens, we see improved child outcomes. We see that as children are getting exposure to these kinds of strategies throughout their daily lives and across a variety of contexts, we're seeing long-term outcomes that are beneficial for the child, including improvements in their communication, their cognitive ability, their daily living skills, and their participation in school. These are critical things to consider when we're thinking about what is the core component of all of these intervention approaches is how we can best support parents to be active partners in the implementation of these approaches. So what is parent coaching? Parent coaching is something that has um, a growing evidence base behind it. And when we're thinking about parent coaching, we're thinking about an interactive process between a practitioner and a parent that involves observation, reflection, and action to promote that parent's ability to support their child's participation in family activities and in community activities. This is an active process. This is a process that involves constant feedback between observing things that are happening in the home, between reflecting on those things that you're observing in the home, and taking some sort of action with the parent as your partner to guide how you are coaching that family through those routines. It's important to note that um, when we're thinking about parent coaching, adult learning theory 
can be used to provide an evidence-based framework for how to coach parents. Adult learning theory is based on the premise that adults benefit from specific strategies to motivate and teach them. It includes instructional strategies that can be applied across a variety of domains for adult learners and has been success successfully applied to improve staff performance in a variety of work, educational, and clinical settings, as well as in training for foster parents and parents of picky eaters. It's now being applied to training of parents of children with autism spectrum disorder. And it's important to note that the whole premise behind using adult learning theory to guide how you are coaching parents is the idea that parents, adults have specific and distinct needs in how they are being taught to implement and taught learn new skills. So adults often need to know why they should learn something. This is critical and one of the foundational principles of adult learning theory. It states that when you're teaching an adult to do something, in addition to just telling them what to do, there's inherent need to tell them why they should learn something. And we think about how we can support parents of children with autism, it's important to think about how are we sharing that information with parents? How are we sharing what we're working on with, with their children and why it's important? It's also important to note that within adult learning theory, uh, adults are viewed as problem solvers. And so adults inherently are motivated to solve problems. And so when we are presented with conflicting situations, one of the active components of adult learning theory is that we are coming up with solutions collaboratively to solve those problems. Additionally, when we're thinking about adult learning theory, it's important to note that adults are thought to benefit most when they are involved in the planning and in the instruction of the, of the material, rather than just presenting the material to the adults. Um, it's important to think about how we can work with parents collaboratively and involve them in the planning of their child's treatment and the planning of the goals that their child will be working on. We also know that adults learn best when the subject is of immediate use. And so when we're teaching parents skills for their child, we should be working with them about things that are immediately useful to them rather than things that aren't as concrete. And we want to make sure that we are using a lot of practice because we know that adults learn best by doing. This is an established principle and rather than sitting and talking with a parent about what it is that you're working on, we need to encourage parents to participate in the activities because adults actively participating in routines and in the learning activity is most likely to lead to beneficial learning for that, for that person. So I raise this point here to bring special attention to the fact that adult learning theory implies an active and intentional learning process that involves collaboration, practice, and supportive ongoing feedback. And as clinicians working with parents of young children with autism, we often fail to attend to and support the parents' learning in the same way that we attend to and support the child's learning by using targeted and systematic strategies. And so my position here today is that we need to use targeted and systematic strategies in order to systematically support parent learning. And that to do so, we should draw from adult learning theory to actively coach parents in the use of these techniques. And so here are some examples of what parent coaching strategies that are based in adult learning theory might look like. The first would be to teach within authentic learning experiences. And so this is a coaching strategy that implies that when you are working with a parent, learning should occur within real life problems or daily routines. So if you think about an early intervention session, we're thinking about how to include parent um, through mealtime um, and how to include strategies through uh, that would be used during bathing um, and daily routines rather than in a distinct separate session. Another strategy, um, a coaching strategy that's based in adult learning theory is the idea of joint planning. And this isn't critical for early intervention. When we think of joint planning, we want to make sure that the parent is actively involved in selecting goals and strategies for learning. Too often, when we think about early intervention and treatment for children with autism, goals are developed without parent input, and goals are given to parents based on an assessment. Um, but those, those goals may not be the most important goals for that parent and that family in the moment. And so making sure that we are jointly planning with parents and collaborating with them on the goals that we're working on with their child is critical to make sure that these goals are effective and meaningful. Another coaching strategy is demonstration. And this is critical to adult learning theory and critical to coaching. And so we want to make sure that when you're working with the parent, you're actively modeling these techniques 
through role plays, and through actual application with their child. We all know that learning happens when you, when you see something happening in front of you, and so modeling and demonstration actively with parents is critical to make sure that they're able to learn these techniques as well. And related to that is in vivo feedback. And this is when the practitioner observes the parent using a technique and then provides that parent with immediate feedback about their performance or their use of that technique. This is a critical aspect of parent coaching that I often see absent from early intervention sessions. And so we might have some demonstration happening, um, but there isn't often an opportunity for a parent then to practice using the skills that they've observed and to receive feedback on their use of those techniques. This is a critical aspect of adult learning theory that I think should be applied largely to parent coaching when we're working with early intervention. And the last is reflection. We want to make sure that a practitioner is working with parents to help them self-evaluate and assess their performance and also assess whether or not the techniques and the goals and the strategies that you're using are appropriate and helpful and have been effective for that family. Another important part of reflection with parents is the idea of feasibility. And so as practitioners, we often make suggestions, we make recommendations regarding how a parent should use a certain technique, but those techniques may not be feasible for parents within their daily lives. Parents have other children. Parents have jobs and lives and have daily household activities that they have to complete. And so making sure that part of that reflection process is having open dialogue about how the strategies are being implemented and whether or not the strategies that you are suggesting as a practitioner are appropriate and feasible for that parent to use within the midst of what can often be busy and stressful lives. And so we know that parent coaching is an evidence-based approach. We know that there are specific strategies that can be used to coach parents. And we know from these university-based randomized trials of these efficacious parent-mediated interventions that coaching parents in the use of intervention techniques can lead to important and significant gains for both parents and for children. But what does early intervention look like in the real world? What does early intervention look like in places that are not university-based research labs? These are the places where most children and families receive their treatment. And so it's important to think about, we have an idea of what kinds of approaches are used and efficacious in university-based studies, but what are we learning from community-based implementation of these approaches? And what do these approaches look like when they are translated into the real world? What we are seeing is that in community-based settings of early intervention, um, we often see ther therapist-mediated intervention as opposed to parent-mediated intervention. What we see is a traditional model of a therapist coming into a home, working with a child uh, for a session, potentially explaining to the parent what they worked on with that child, um, and potentially the parent might observe and um, see what's happening with that child, with their child during the session. But we aren't seeing a lot of parent-mediated intervention within community settings that involves actively coaching parents to implement the intervention techniques. And so there has been some preliminary research looking into this. Um, and when we look at this, we see that early intervention providers spend the majority of their time in traditional child-focused intervention as opposed to, as opposed to the new parent-mediated model of intervention. And so a few recent studies that I want to highlight here that have specifically looked at how parents are incorporated into a traditional early intervention session. And so the first we see that in a study by Campbell and Sawyer, 70% of early intervention providers time was child focused rather than focused on the parent. And so when they went in and observed exactly what was happening during these early intervention sessions, we can see that the majority of the time was spent focused on the child as opposed to focused on interacting with the parent. And a similar study that went in and observed how much time the providers were working with the parent using coaching techniques, we can see that less than 1% of the session was spent coaching parents. So the vast majority of the session was spent working directly with the child. But when you ask parents about their time um, spent receiving coaching during early intervention, 23% um, of parents have reported receiving early intervention, receiving coaching through their early intervention. Um, in that same study by Aaron Bari et al., we found that eight, he found that 80% of those same parents wish that they had more parent coaching. And so it's not necessarily that parents are not 
wanting to participate in the intervention. It's not that parents don't wish to, to be involved in the intervention session and to learn the techniques. It's often that there's a mismatch between what we see as an effective tool, uh, the parent coaching, and what is actually being implemented within community-based settings. And so what we see here is a vast research to practice gap um, that's happening within community settings. We know that the research and certainly the newest research is indicating that parent mediated interventions and supporting parents in early intervention is critical for long term outcomes. Um, but what we're seeing as well is that that research is not being translated into practice in community settings for young children with autism. And so part of what I'm interested in learning is why does this gap exist? Why are we seeing such a distinct um, change between what is happening in university-based randomized trials and what is happening in community practice? And so recently I um, am conducting a study um, that's funded through the Institute of Education Sciences called Parent Empowerment and Coaching and Early Intervention, where I hope to answer those very questions. Um, and preliminarily, we're having um, some very exciting and interesting findings about why this gap exists. And I have broken them down into three distinct buckets here. Um, and when we think about them as implementation barriers and the reasons for, for these um, disparities. The first would be related to the providers and the therapists themselves. And we're hearing that providers have distinct pedagogical views towards treatment. That means that they have strong beliefs about what treatment should look like. Many of them believe and strongly adhere to the idea that intervention, especially early intervention, should be focused on the child. Um, and while it's important to include parents in some capacity, um, they also openly discuss the idea that including, including parents is not what they were trained to do. Um, and so therapist training often involves learning how to be a clinician, learning how to work with, child, with the child, learning how to work on communication and social and behavior skills. But learning how to teach an adult to do something requires a specific skill set that often is absent from provider training. When we're talking with parents, we're learning that although many parents certainly wish to learn the skills um, and the strategies that are being used with their child, um, many parents also have specific preferences and expectations for treatment. And so many parents wish that the therapist would come in, work with the child, um, and certainly explain to them what's happening. Um, but the way that the intervention is being delivered may not be most conducive to parent involvement in the treatment. We also know that parents have competing demands and being active participants in that treatment may not be um, something that's feasible for all parents. And we're also learning that the interventions themselves are often related to this, to this implementation gap. We know that these interventions are complex. We know that they have many different pieces, many different strategies that are being used, and these are difficult concepts to teach clinicians, and they're even more difficult to teach parents who are faced with many challenges throughout their daily lives and who are not specifically trained in how to implement these techniques. And so thinking about how we can um, reduce the complexity of these interventions is something that is critical. And last, when we're thinking about um, some barriers to coaching parents is the idea of the treatment goals not necessarily being relevant and appropriate for that aspect of intervention. And so we want to think about the goals that we're using with parents and how we might shape those goals to better support meaningful outcomes for children. And so part of what's important to think about as we are trying to bridge this gap is how we can move these evidence based interventions from research labs into people's homes, how we can support early intervention providers who are working in community settings to implement the techniques that the university based efficacious tr trials are showing as efficacious. One way to think about that is to merge the science and the theories of parent coaching with naturalistic developmental behavioral intervention. These are two emerging fields within the treatment of children with autism that are gaining a lot of attention. And we want to make sure that as we are trying to bring them to the community, that we have a balancing act between targeting appropriate, meaningful intervention goals for the child and also making sure that we are fluidly supporting parents in the use of these intervention goals and in the use of these strategies. This is a balancing act that I'm not sure any of us have fully mastered, but I think it's important to realize that we have to be mindful of the balancing act between supporting children 
and supporting parents in their child's treatment. And it's a fluid back and forth that often um, is not equally weighted. So how can we do that? I think the first thing that we need to do as practitioners working with parents within early intervention is to make a meaningful and purposeful partnership with parents. When we are thinking about early intervention for children with autism, the parent practitioner partnership is essential. And it should be a true partnership of equal weight and equal balance in that the parent's views are just as important as the practitioner, practitioner views. And if not more important, I think that the parent's goals and the parent's treatments preferences should be what drives how each child's intervention is delivered. And having a fluid back and forth conversation with knowledge sharing between the practitioner and the parent is critical to supporting that type of approach to intervention. When we're working with parents, it's important that we are sharing information about treatment and about what is evidence-based, but we are also listening to parents and learning from parents about what works for that child and for that family within that particular circumstance. And we're also incorporating those, that information into our practice as clinicians who are actively supporting and partnering with parents. A way to do that is to make sure that we are actively sharing in the decision-making process with parents. Engagement is likely to improve when parent-implemented interventions include collaborative development of treatment goals, rather than identifying goals and sharing them with parents. It's important that we think about shared decision-making as lying at the intersection between family goals and preferences, clinical evidence and expertise, and the environmental context. I think if we want to make sure that we are properly supporting parents and helping them become active drivers of their child's treatment, then we need to think about how we can more actively share with them in the decision-making process. Related to that is how are we improving parent self-efficacy? How are we making sure that parents are actively involved in their child's treatment and that they are my meaningfully learning the skills that are being taught to them? One way to do that is potentially to simplify the interventions that are being used. Can we identify the core active components of these interventions? And can we make sure that the goals and the strategies that we are using are the ones that are most feasible and appropriate for each individual family's current situation, rather than giving them a complex manual of approaches um, that may be overwhelming for clinicians and certainly overwhelming for many families. We want to make sure that we are giving them lots of opportunities for guided practice, that we aren't just telling them what we're doing with their child, that we are showing them what we're doing, and that we are guiding them through the implementation of those strategies. Frequent feedback is critical to this, and often I see providers that are hesitant to give feedback to parents um, because it's a bit awkward, but I encourage you all to um, overcome that awkward feeling and to make sure that we are able to support parents um, and give them supportive feedback about their use of techniques. But in order to make that work and in order to make that something that is actually sustainable, it's important that we are thinking about the treatment goals that we are using in our early intervention program. And it's important to make sure that they are meaningful. Um, often I see intervention goals that aren't directly related to a family's overall daily life. And because of that, aren't directly addressable within daily routines. And so pulling from the developmental frame of making sure that we are incorporating relevant practice opportunities into each child's treatment and into each child's um, work with their parent so that it's appropriate and feasible. Rather than working on goals within a therapeutic session, it would be wonderful for clinicians to work with parents within their daily routines, like meal time and bath time and dressing, and think about what are the naturally occurring play opportunities that might occur within a family's life that would absolutely lend themselves well to incorporating these kinds of routines and these kinds of strategies. I think that if we want to empower parents to use these kinds of approaches, it's important to make sure that we are supporting them in the use of these approaches and in interactions that are meaningfully and directly re relevant to their lives. But I 
want to make sure that we cons consider some important points um, when we're thinking about parent coaching, um, because I often have seen this misinterpreted and um, used in a way that is not intended. And so when we're thinking about parent coaching um, as a way to support parents, um, we are not thinking about parent coaching as a way to maximize opportunities for treatment. This does not necessarily mean that parent coaching is something that should be used to increase the dosage of treatment hours for children. Um, parent coaching in and of itself does not mean that we are now teaching parents to become clinicians. And parent coaching certainly should not be used as a substitute for other treatments or as a replacement for treatment hours. When we are thinking about parent coaching, we are not expecting their parents to become therapists through parent coaching. Um, what we are instead thinking about is how can we best support parents to improve family functioning? How can we empower parents to support their child's complex needs? This is an important distinction um, and a critical one when we're thinking about the implications of supporting parents in their child's early intervention. While it's critical to coach them and to support them, um, this should be done in um, a supportive, uh, collaborative partnership, and it is not intended to be a forum for um, making parents therapists. Instead, it really is intended to be a forum for supporting parents and learning essential skills to improve their overall family functioning and empowering them to support their child um, in early intervention and throughout their lives. And so I'll end there um, and I'm thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Melanie. Um, we got a few questions in, but if others would like to still ask a question, you can um, certainly send that in. So <clears throat> one of the questions was um, for families that are uh, just beginning their autism journey, how uh, can they sort through some of the noise with different um, early intervention uh, techniques? And are, are there resources that you recommend um, that, that people look at? Yeah, that's a great question because there is, um, like you said, a lot of noise and there are a lot of different approaches and there are a lot of um, strong opinions related to those approaches. Um, and so I think one thing that I always encourage families to do um, when they are navigating this early intervention process um, is to ask many questions of the providers who you are working with to make sure that you're comfortable with the responses that you're getting and to honestly trust your own opinions about what you feel is an appropriate intervention for your child. Um, and so first and foremost, I think that is essential for parents to be comfortable doing, um, to ask questions, to ask more questions, and to make sure that the approach that's being implemented with their child is one that they are seeing uh, as effective uh, and one that they are seeing as um, one that is compatible with their family's values. I think in terms of resources, um, there are many that are out there. Autism Speaks um, has some great um, resources that are available that um, describe different kind of intervention approaches um, in a nutshell um, and give brief synopsis of those. So that might be a good starting point. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> another question is, how uh, would you partner parents with parents to, to mutually um, positively influence each other? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and so we have um, a, a study that we're doing right now um, where we are doing just that. Um, and we are pairing pa parents with a peer um, parent of an older child with autism. So we're pairing parents of newly diagnosed children with autism to older children, parents of older children with autism to sort of coach them through and help them navigate this, um, you know, stressful time of their lives. Um, and so I think that there are many, um, we found that that has been very beneficial to families. We found that families often just want to have someone who's been through it to talk with them um, and to guide them through this process. Um, and I think that the best way to do that is to reach out to your local um, district or your local um, autism resource center. Um, because what we're learning when we're partnering with other sites across the country is that many places already have these um, informal peer mentoring um, situations already established. And so um, 
asking if there are other parent support groups available um, through your district or through um, your regional centers could certainly be a great way to start that. But I think if you can join um, a local autism group um, and connect with other families, that is critical for parents having um, a sounding board. Okay. <clears throat> um, someone says that they see a big difference between what is done for one to three year olds versus three to five year olds with the big drop off in parent training and coaching after the age of three. What do you recommend during this transition time when service providers and funding changes? Yeah, that's a really great point. And it's absolutely true. And so when you think about early intervention for children under three, um, the, it is designed to be a family centered program. Um, when children turn three, um, it's designed to be a program that helps them get ready for school. Um, and so the, the mission and the philosophy of each of these um, different funding sources, you know, is different and can be very challenging for parents. Um, what I often encourage parents to do, um, parents who are transitioning from the zero to three system to a three to five system, um, is to ask for more parent training, is to ask um, as they are going through the process, how are parents involved? How will I be involved? How will I learn the skills that you're working on with my child? If the child is going to a preschool program, what is that preschool program's approach to incorporating parents and guiding parents um, through the intervention process? I think that we can um, encourage parents to ask for those things um, and to have them written into their treatment plans, into their IEPs um, as a way to um, ensure that that happens. All right. Um, do you see a role in parent coaching around mindfulness, self-compassion, that sort of uh, thing to, to improve overall self-efficacy? Absolutely. And so I think um, what I spoke about today was parent coaching as it relates to child, um, the child skills. But working with parents um, in terms of self-care is absolutely critical. And so helping parents understand that they need um, to take some time for themselves Mindfulness is a great way to do that. Um, take some time to decompress and to have an opportunity to uh, engage in self-care activities, whatever they may be, is absolutely, I think, um, an essential aspect of supporting parents uh, throughout early intervention. Okay, we have another question. It might be a little off topic, and I don't know if you have an answer, but we'll just uh, pose it anyway. Um, someone was asking about how would you suggest a teacher break the ice on talking to parents about their child possibly having autism? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think that it's tricky um, because although um, teachers, you know, are, are certainly uh, trained, they work with many different children, they can um, see when something is certainly not typical development. Um, I think my recommendation to teachers is always to make the suggestion that um, it seems like something um, might be getting in the way of your child's learning. I have noticed that your child is struggling with X, Y, and Z, whatever the things are that the child is struggling with, um, and make the suggestion for an evaluation. Um, I often don't encourage teachers to say, I think your child might have autism, um, because the only way that we know that for sure is through a comprehensive diagnostic evaluation. And those words um, certainly can cause a lot of tension. Um, and so we wanna make sure that there actually is um, a case of autism before we are um, making that suggestion. And so when I'm working with teachers, I usually just encourage them to um, tell parents that there are some areas of concern um, and that they should uh, perhaps pursue an evaluation and strongly encourage the parent to pursue an evaluation while giving them the resources needed to find the appropriate evaluation sites. Great, thank you for that. Um, so we're, I, we don't have any other questions at the moment. Um, we can stay on for a few more minutes to see if anything comes through. Okay. Uh, let's see. Anything else from anyone that's still on? Feel free to send it in the chat.
Hmm, okay. Someone says, any idea about how insurance companies will accept parent coaching as an EBT? Yeah, that's a great question. And so parent coaching within and of itself um, probably wouldn't be something that um, is necessarily um, accepted by an insurance company, though depending on the state, um, I know that there are some states that do have parent training um, or parent therapy as a billable code. Um, broadly, um, rather than going through the insurance company, for my recommendation to parent is to talk to your provider um, and ask your provider how they can incorporate this kind of approach into their session. And so if you have an ABA provider or another kind of provider, um, you want to ask them how they can um, incorporate parent coaching. Um, encourage them to do so if that's something that you're interested in, um, because those services are already getting um, approved for, uh, for billing purposes. Um, and so rather than uh, seek something else out, I think it's probably a better route to talk with your current service providers about how to incorporate this approach into what they're already doing. Okay. Um, and then someone says, should parents join in on therapy appointments? Absolutely. Yes, um, an enthusiastic yes. And so I think that um, especially with an early intervention, and so when we're thinking about kids who are five and under, um, but I don't think this only applies to young children, um, parents absolutely should be involved and should sit in and should actively participate in those sessions. I know this is not something that uh, all providers do or want to do, um, but my stance is wholeheartedly that parents should participate in sessions um, and should be an active participant in those sessions. And then a follow-up to that was um, how, how to approach this, joining in with therapists. Yeah, and so um, I tend to be a, a bit more direct than others, um, and my approach would be I want to join in your sessions. I want to know about what you're working with my child. I want to know how I can learn to use this things that you're doing with my child when he's not with you. Um, and so I want to learn from you how I can do that. I think that these are um, very direct conversations that parents can and should have with their therapists about um, being involved. Um, and I would encourage parents if they're getting pushback to think through, um, you know, what is the reason for that pushback? And is this the best, best fit for me? If being included in the session is something that's important to you, um, then I would encourage parents to um, advocate for that as a part of their treatment. Okay. And then do you have any resources or thoughts on how early intervention professionals can learn how to be a better coach? Yeah, sure. Um, and so there are um, certainly a lot of resources available. And so Rush and Sheldon, Hamped Rush and Sheldon. Um, and if somebody wants to email me, I can... Um, certainly send the exact citation links. Um, but there are some great books that are directly about how to coach parents within early childhood. These don't specifically apply to autism. Um, they're more related to early childhood more broadly, um, and they are designed for early intervention providers that are working with parents of young children um, and specifically target how to coach parents. Um, and so Rush and Sheldon are the, the pioneers in uh, thinking through how to apply that to early intervention. And if you uh, read their books, you could get some great uh, advice on how to do that. Okay. Are there special areas of parent coaching for dads versus moms? Oh, that's a great question. Um, and so, you know, I don't know that there um, necessarily is a distinction between uh, using these strategies with dads versus with moms. Um, what I will say is that as a clinician working with families, um, I think each individual parent has their own style and their own preferences. And so it's our job to make sure that we are um, mindful of those and using the strategies that work best with each individual family. And so dads may, um, you know, be more like, be more hesitant to, uh, to do a technique after it was um, just demonstrated. Um, and so making sure that we are giving opportunities for that might be something that happens, but that may not always be the case. Um, you know, certainly sometimes we've worked with families where one parent is uh, more involved than the other, and that's completely fine. Um, whatever works for each individual family, I think is what we need to consider, and we need to tailor our approaches for each individual family. Okay, great. Um, 
how much time do you think is appropriate for parents to try one approach before deciding that it might not be working or, or be the best fit for their child? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, unfortunately, I think that it's very um, individualized. What I do think is that um, it's important for parents to um, make sure their child um, is making progress in some way. And so progress is certainly different from one child to another. Um, if you're unsure of your child's progress, then I would encourage you to talk with your provider and to ask for objective and concrete um, indication of what progress the child has made. Um, and so this might be something that would happen over several months. Um, this could be something that could happen over a few weeks. Um, but I think, you know, the timing is something that is hard to judge based on uh, without knowing the individual circumstances. But I do think that if you're unsure if your child, if the program is the best fit for your child, then ask those kinds of questions of your provider, ask them to demonstrate to you uh, what skills your child has learned. Um, and then aside from that, I often encourage parents, um, you know, do, is your child happy during intervention? Um, is your child excited to be a part of that? Um, and if so, then I think that that's, that's great. And if not, then you might want to think about why not um, and what you can do to potentially change that. Okay, you kind of covered this in the beginning, but could you go over what types of early intervention are out there? Sure, and so I think um, broadly, I mean, there are many different types, but when we're thinking about early intervention for children with autism, they broadly fall into those two categories of the developmental approaches and behavioral approaches. Um, and so that is just in terms of the treatment for autism. Um, aside from that, there are, you know, certainly speech and language therapy, occupational therapy, and related services that are um, different intervention approaches um, that are certainly important and a part of each child's comprehensive treatment. But when we're, when we're thinking about the autism specific interventions, um, largely they fall into those developmental or behavioral approaches with the, the new uh, paradigm shift of being um, a, a combination of each of those.